Ralph, um, why don't we start at the end of the table there? Ethan, why don't you uh, tell us about your studio, about yourself, and uh, what differentiates you from the other panelists? Sure. Oh. Hello? The, uh, the yellow. Okay, that works a lot better. <laughs> nice. So I'm going to keep it top line because I think David uh, has already done a great job giving you a sense of what we do. And uh, I'm proud to say that most people know what Sega is when my wife uh, introduces me to new friends and tells them what I do. Uh, whether or not they're gamers, they usually just scream, Sega! <laughs> so I'm happy that uh, you know people love our brands and what we do. Um, what I've been excited about is that we have these incredible characters that have stood the test of time that people loved when they grew up and uh, they love today. And one of the things we're most often asked is, where's the Dreamcast 2? You know, that's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> and I can answer that, actually. The Dreamcast 2 is the mobile phone. And I don't mean to be flipped when I say that because I'm working right now in a game called Kingdom Conquest 2, which is done by the person who created Typing of the Dead. I'm working on a new game that is done by the guy who created Jet Set Radio. So the guys that made the games that you loved on Dreamcast are making games on mobile because that's the place where they can make the most forward-thinking, exciting, uh, new gameplay experiences, and that's why we all love the Dreamcast. So um, that's a uh, short story long, and uh, thanks. Crazy Taxi. <laughs> How's it going? My name's Matt Curtis. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Product Management or mobile, something or other, as you said earlier. But um, I work at Kabam. Uh, we haven't been around as long as Sega, obviously. But you know, one of the things that we definitely focus on are our franchises. Um, for instance, you know, what probably differentiates us, we are successful on web in the free-to-play space. That's where we started. Um, the Kings of Camelot on Facebook and Kabam.com. And we were able to transition that onto the mobile platform on the Apple, on the Google, with Kings of Camelot, Golf of the North. Um, I'm proud to say that you know it's it's a two hundred million dollar franchise, which, which puts it in like the top strategy franchises of all time. But you know what we're focused on is really just high quality, high fidelity games. Um, our more, most recent has been Fast and the Furious Six. Um, if you haven't played it, I recommend it. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, we've also done The Hobbit, Kings of Noah's. But uh, yeah, we started in free to play and. That's, that's what we uh, continue to try and optimize and uh, perfect. Hi everyone. I, I guess I, I just uh, yeah just found a family there and then I will keep this shop. I think I think three three things really actually make Fun Plus unique is one is that we actually uh, we actually uh, uh, create products for the global first time gay, gay gamers and yeah. the second is we really think of uh, the service company. Not only a game com 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 company. The third, actually, by playing our games, we are not only impact users, we also empower your 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 users. So that is actually the three uniqueness of complex. Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Philip Yun, and I'm the CEO of We Made USA. <laughs> It's the name of the company. Uh, but our company name is We Made Entertainment, based on South Korea, and. Uh, we are a pretty big company down there in Asian, Asian territories and about three months ago we uh, built up this US operation and uh, we have an office in Palo Alto and like Fun Plus we are hiring lots of people for all the position so after the meeting if you guys are looking for a job in any position talk to me after that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Um, so the first topic I want to talk about is I think we can all agree that the games industry as a whole is a little bit of flux right now. Uh, we've got the new home consoles coming out this year. We've got a whole new genre of consoles with the micro console, Android based things. And then of course there's the big thing that very few people saw coming and that's the 1.2 billion mobile gaming users. Um, let's start with the, the new consoles. Is there any reason for anyone to buy a new console now? Now that they have uh, you know, half a million games on this device? I certainly hope so. <laughs> there we go. I certainly hope so. I put $100 down myself on one of the two. I won't say which one. Um, <laughs> come on, come on. But yeah, I think uh, there is a space for that. Because um, what's great is that you have 
gamers that have grown up with a controller in their hands, and I think buttons still matter. Yes. I love touch-based games, they're fantastic, but I want to use a controller as well. And I want to use it on my big screen. And I want to stream it to uh, my video. Maybe that gives away what I just said. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's important to me. Uh, and so, you know, I think that uh, while I'll always be playing free-to-play games, and I'm very, very happy that I have that experience, I, I think there's also plenty of room for uh, premium console experiences as well. Yeah. Um, I'm also a console fan, um, but you know, being in the free-to-play industry for the past three years, and it's something we've said before, the mobile space especially, is definitely disrupting consoles. I think there will always be that niche of core gamer who will probably like consoles, but you know, as you said, millions upon millions of users are on mobile now, um, and the, the, the systems themselves are getting higher fidelity all the time. The release cadence, you know, consoles are coming out every, what, three, four years, there's a new tablet out there every six months or less, and they're much more powerful every time. So, you know, going forward, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what happens. And I think, um, although, you know, there is that, there is that niche, that, that core gamer niche, um, it may actually move to mobile um, in the near future based on how powerful they're becoming. I guess I have no comments on console. But uh, we are firm believer of mo mo mobile because we believe mobile actually can reach out to much broader audience and most of them actually are first time game, game, gamer. So they don't need either, either education on how to play uh, on the console. So, so that's actually uh, fantastic first thing. We are focused on the mobile and so, so, social together. Yeah, I'm also the uh, big console pad, uh, but the problem is if there's any specific reason that we need a new console at this time. The previous generation console, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, is still powerful and the game, you know, show a lot of things, but I didn't got that much excitement from the new generation console. Yeah, I think another uh, interesting curveball with that whole thing is, uh, you know, Apple announcing support for controllers. That's, to me, is an obvious play for TV. That's the first step, you know, get a few thousand games in the store that support controllers and then announce apps on Apple TV. Um, it's going to be an interesting year, that's for sure. And, uh, to me, that's a little bit more of a competition for OUYA and similar than it is for the consoles. But. So um, let's talk about uh, E3. That happened purely coincidentally at the same time as uh, WWDC, I'm sure. Um, what big trends did you see this year at E3? What's, what should we be watching for the rest of the year? Well, E3 is always visually entertaining, and this year is also, you know, there's a lot of entertaining thing. but like what I said, there's a new generation console, but they, other than, to me, just for the motorsports, other than that, I don't really see any more, like, you know, stunning graphics in, from my end of games. That's what I realized. Personally, I didn't follow E3 too much, so I will just give the Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously the E3 was dominated by the new consoles. It was a coincidence that, you know, they just released those. But as I said, you know, going forward, especially with the mobile devices becoming much more powerful, you already see, you know, AAA companies, um, you know, more traditional companies moving to that space. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the future E3s. Um, you know, I, I believe that there's going to be a lot more mobile platforms, phone, tablet, um, that are going to be more prominent in the future. Um, and as far as WWDC is concerned, you know, it's, it's a good sign for us that, you know, Apple is embracing that. I know that there's some Game Center changes as well. Um, I think it's too early to call, but uh, it, it's at least optimistic. As far as I see it, we've, we've made it. We're finally at a point where everyone is playing games. And that's awesome. I love that. Um, you know, my kid, who's six, is playing games. Um, my wife is playing games when she goes to bed on the iPhone. I, again, am playing um, an incredible mix of great free-to-play casual games, core games on the smartphone, and all the console devices. Uh, people are going to find their niche. They're going to go to uh, different devices and, and find that special experience. And for some, it's going to be Call of Duty. And for some, it's going to be Real Racing or Clash of Clans. But the point is, is that they're all out there now. And so people who love to play games can play them anywhere they are. 
And, uh, you know, again, you can play them all like I do, or you can find that one specific niche. But again, we're all gamers now, like we're all readers, like we're all movie watchers. And it wasn't like that back when the 360 and the PS3 was launched in 2005. The market's changed, and, and the free-to-play and smartphone market has a lot to do with that. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, let's switch gears a little bit. That's probably enough about consoles for this mobile audience. Uh, <laughs> let's, um, let's talk about some of the, the way mobile games are launched. That's different than any kind of other traditional publishing, okay, consoles or anything else. Um, we talked about this uh, on the phone before, and it's um, interesting to see that uh, with a lot of launches, the, there's a big buildup. With mobile, there's a very small build-up. All of the marketing is handled after. What is your standard go-to-market plan for a mobile game? <coughs> Just a high-level timeline, obviously. Not for I'm not sure how much I can actually divulge, but um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, the Fast and Furious Six is a great example. Um, that was a game where we had a robust uh, go-to-market plan in place. Obviously, we had a huge IP behind it. It was topical. Um, and you know we were able to work with NBCU early enough to really coordinate so we could release the game around the same time as the movie, and that that paid off dividends. Um, you know we were featured. I think since it was released in mid-May, we've gotten 17 million users, and like that's a huge boost to anything, regardless of the game. And obviously, like I said, there was a large franchise behind it. But you could potentially do that with any game you have, um, and and really when we do put together our go-to-markets, that's what we're looking for. We're, we're trying to figure out what's the optimum release strategy, what do we need to do in, in order to get this in front of as many players as possible. So, um, you know, however we can leverage, you know, external IP, internal IP, et cetera, um, that's, that's what we focus on. So I, I think uh, specifically what I was thinking is that, uh, you know, with, with console launch, uh, the marketing spend is focused only on launch day. Whereas with mobile, you pretty much start your marketing spend on launch day. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, you market a game after it's been launched? Yeah. So I think that's actually going to change a little bit, especially as games become higher fidelity. Um, even though there's technically infinite shelf space, there's you know, limited visibility. Only your top apps are really going to be seen by consumers. Um, but afterwards, you know, there's quite a few ways that that we go about it, and you know, one of our core competencies that we developed when we were on web is performance marketing. And I don't want to get into too many technical de details, mainly because I don't want to bore everyone. But um, you know, it's it's something that we've optimized over time, um, and we we were lucky enough to launch Kings of Camelot early on to kind of learn the nuances of mobile, and uh, we definitely use that to our advantage. It is interesting because it is one of those things where visibility is what will drive organic traffic. And uh, if you're not at the top of the charts, it's, it's very hard to uh, get people's attention. Uh, one thing that is great, though, about social games, of course, is that when you're doing new events and you do things like tie-ins, you know, you saw that great thing that Clash of Clans is doing with uh, Puzzle and Dragon, right? That's, that's really cool, and that's going to draw your attention. And if you haven't played this game, but you've heard about it five, six, seven times, maybe that's the thing that makes you say, okay, I'm going to give it a try. Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, the types of things that, that we're looking for. Um, now, that's, that's an advantage we have when we have big brands and we can look at uh, partnerships that make sense. Uh, but uh, even with new IP, uh, games like Kingdom Conquest 2, we're, we're looking at um, all the different ways we can um, make events exciting to people, relevant to people, um, and uh, territory specific to people so that uh, that's something that is interesting for an editor to talk about. For us, I think before we go to the market, I think there are two principles we, we have to get is one is the high quality of, of games. So high quality from two aspects, one from graphics, another is from gameplay. And, and the second the same point actually, we have to have a high engagement. So for each market, we are trying to look at the different social graphs. So we need a social graph in place before we launch the game. And after the launch, launch game, I think we had a one advantage is we have a huge user base on Facebook. So we just uh, do the cross promotion, but also we are trying out different app promotion uh, providers to figure out what's the best, best way to actually to promote the game. 
Um, so we haven't launched any game, we haven't done any marketing yet in US markets, so probably, you know, talk about a little bit of the success story in Asian market. You probably heard about the uh, Line or Kakao in Japan and Korea, which is very different ecosystem that people doesn't go to the app stores or Apple, Google Play Store to find the game. They actually found the game through this discovery network, which is the messenger system that you're using every day, just like WhatsApp and, and those kind of app that you highly use and almost every day. And then people find the new game through that network and then that actually do most of the marketing function in those countries. So that's a very different ecosystem. 